Hi, I'm Chris and you're watching Stigma Talks. I'm here with Dr. Henrietta Bowden-Jones, founder and director of the National Problem Gambling Clinic. Hi, I'm Henrietta and I support Stigma 1 in 4. So, you founded and direct the National Problem Gambling Clinic. I thought you could just give us a bit of information about how it started and how it's been since you founded it. Yes, um, I started the clinic in 2008. Uh, at that time, uh, there were no NHS clinics providing treatment for pathological gambling, and I felt very much that this was a need that needed to be addressed in order to help the half a million pathological gamblers in the UK. So that's half a million pathological gamblers. Can you break down the statistics and the numbers of people affected? Um, the prevalence of pathological gambling in the UK is 0.9%. Here at the clinic, we have about 700 referrals a year. So there are many, many people we know who are out there who are requiring help and are not actually accessing services. Uh, roughly 5% of people with this illness will be accessing services. The rest of the people are out there trying to help themselves in some way. So it's due to a lack of awareness. People don't realise either that there's help available or that perhaps that it's a problem for them, that what they have is an illness that can be treated. Pathological gambling has been called the hidden addiction uh, because it's not, it's not common to have signs of the illness. It is possible for people to be aware of the problem existing. For example, they may be extremely in debt. Some of our patients have lost their homes because of problem gambling, have remortgaged their houses, or have uh, remortgaged their parents' houses to, to get money to, to gamble. About half of them have lost their marriages because of the illness, and many of them have lost touch with their children. Several of our patients have lost their jobs. I've had patients who have been gambling whilst their wife has been giving birth. I've had quite a few, actually. In their minds, they thought, I want to give my unborn child a better future. If I go gambling, by the time they're born, I will be rich, and this will change their chances in life. But of course, the reality is that they've ended up losing money, and their wife has not had them there during the birth. It's a serious illness and yet um, it is possible to walk around and not, not show this, uh, this distress other than in a manifestation of depression or anxiety that can accompany the symptoms of pathological gambling. Okay. So it's, it seems it ranges as, as a huge scale from one of people spending money they should be spending on food to the whole way of people remortgaging family members' homes. Absolutely. We have found that uh, uh, just about over 80% of our patients here have committed illegal acts at some point or other to fund their gambling. Sometimes, in an extreme case, people have stolen from their work employers uh, because they are so compulsively driven to obtaining money and they've borrowed from friends and family and they this is the next step let's say so it can really drive you into behaviors that are not normally part of your repertoire yeah so some people watching this might think that gambling it's fun but as you've explained there it's something that can affect people in a much more severe way is that that's something to do with just a personality trait or a, a kind of disposition that's within someone's genetic makeup? About 70, just over 70% of the population in this country gambles. So if you remove the lottery, it still is about uh, 50%. So it's a common activity and only a small minority end up having problems. But so having that as a context, then yes, the people who end up experiencing pathological gambling issues are normally people who have a vulnerability towards this behavior. And about a third of the people I treat here are people whose relatives are pathological gamblers. And uh, of course with these people it's very difficult to know how much the genetics has impacted on the development of this illness. We are finding that there are some characteristics in our patients, for example the death of a parent at an early age, separation or divorce of parents in childhood, a, a very hostile home environment, 
possible physical, sexual or emotional abuse or even emotional neglect that will lead people to gamble as an escape from a very early age. And then we have early big wins. These are people who may be gambling as students at university and they may have experienced one early big win uh, or their friend might have done and, and in some way vicariously this has triggered some mechanism at a sort of neuronal level in your brain that makes you makes you find uh, gambling exciting and in some way puts a compulsive edge to it so you cannot stop gambling. So when it comes to treating pathological gambling, mm -hmm. what kind of treatment do you provide? We offer here at the National Problem Gambling Clinic a very cognitive behavioural approach to treatment. We know that 80% of people who come through this clinic will do well. Um, the majority of these people will be completely abstinent from gambling at the end of treatment. Treatment lasts a couple of months with weekly appointments um, in a group setting. Uh, the treatment is manualised and it's, uh, it's, as I said, it's eight sessions and in each session we address a different topic and it's all about trying to shape your behaviour using cognitive behavioural techniques so that the negative, harmful behaviour, the gambling, gets replaced by more productive, positive behaviours. So with the cognitive behavioural therapy, that's a two-month course, that seems like a very quick turnaround in relation to drug addictions or alcohol addiction. What, what exactly do you do in that that makes it much quicker? The period of eight weeks during which we deliver the uh, psychological treatment is um, based on the research that has uh, taken place in the States and in Australia showing that significant positive results can be obtained with treatment that lasts that long. And I would love to run longer programs and I would love to have a day hospital here, but funding um, means that I won't, I'm not doing that at the moment, but may be able to do that in the future. So there's the kind of been the rise of the past few years of online gambling, which allows people to gamble in their own homes. How has this affected what, what you do? Online gambling is definitely on the increase, and we are prepared eventually to see our patients possibly migrate from some forms of land-based gambling to more internet gambling. At the moment we've only seen a mild increase and about 40% of our patients are now gambling online, although they may not be purely doing it online, they may also be attending um, uh, casinos and playing in bookmakers. What is clear is that online gambling is accessible uh, at any time of the day or night and the availability of the online gambling in one's home makes it harder to resist if you're a pathological gambler in particular. So one of the first things we do is we try and reduce the harm uh, that the environment potentially has on the individual and we get people to self-exclude from gambling sites on the internet. So self-exclusion, can you explain that as a process? Yes. It's about trying to limit the availability of the gambling in the immediacy. So if you uh, go onto the websites that you normally play and you ask them to exclude you as one of the players, they have a duty to um, follow your request and they will block you from accessing their gambling site and once they've blocked their access it makes it uh, much harder for them to find enjoyment and to uh, return to a type of gambling that they found problematic. Well Dr Bowden Jones thank you very much for talking to us that's all we've got time for you've been watching Stigma Talks.